it is with great pleasure that I would like to open the Industry Day, day two of the Castle Workshop. Thank you all for joining on this fine day. And what's going to happen is today we're going to hear talks from a number of speakers that focuses on the primary theme of the workshop, and that is building ecosystems for AI at scale. And this is really focusing on the recent large-scale type of AI model that generates language results, image results, and how organizations can gain the self-sufficiency, that's the ecosystem part, to build and manage these models. And now, I, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, you know, the president and professor at MBZUAI, Eric Singh, who will give the opening remarks for AI at scale. So please welcome Eric. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, sorry for not being able to uh, be with the workshop yesterday during its opening. I was actually busy giving another talk at JITEX you know, uh, on a similar thing. In fact, this is the fifth talk I did, I'm, I was doing you know, in the past uh, one week. I'm getting a little bit fatigued on you know, <laughs> giving talks. Uh, therefore, uh, I wasn't uh, super careful in preparing you know, uh, today's slide deck, it might be too long you know, for this event. Uh, if you start to feel fatigue, just shout out. I'm going to stop and uh, leave the, 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 the floor to, uh, to uh, subsequent speakers, okay? Um, I guess you know, uh, it is probably a proper for me to begin by uh, giving a bit context of, uh, first of all, the bigger picture, the AI Quorum, right? So AI Quorum is a new event series uh, that uh, we MBZUI created, you know, to really transform, you know, uh, not only this university, but also uh, the city of Abu Dhabi and the country of UAE to be the next go-to place of uh, AI innovation and fundamental research. So it's to create, to seed, and to grow a culture of uh, critical thinking of uh, scientific exploration and also of a technological enablement in the space of computer science and AI. And why it's called a quorum? Because uh, it is really a stage that will bring the preeminent leaders, younger leaders, senior leaders, to come here and uh, brainstorm and exchange ideas and developments you know, in artificial intelligence. It's like the old day, you know, uh, the the, the school of essence, for example, where we see great thinkers, you know, gather periodically, you know, to uh, enjoy that uh, uh, small episode of, uh, you know, scientific exploration. And uh, in this particular year, our AI Quorum will feature a sequence of uh, six workshops. We already had one last week, uh, led by Professor Michael Jordan on collaborative learning, and now we are in the second one, you know, focusing on scalable AI computing and the inference. And uh, subsequently, we have uh, workshops you know, in natural language processing led by Professor Tim, our own Professor Tim Baldwin, and also another workshop on robotics led by a Berkeley professor, Ken Goldenberg, another workshop on console inference led by Bernard Shokov from Germany, and so on. So it's a fantastic, amazing program that uh, has never been you know, uh, organized like that before, anywhere in the world, not only in here, but also back in the States or in Europe. It's uh, uh, something you can imagine that as the new scientific version of uh, uh, Davos World Economic Forum. I think that's our ambition. We want to turn that into a scope and a, uh, uh, maybe a level of excellence of that nature, hopefully a few years from now. So that's basically AI Quorum. Um, then come down to this particular workshop, you may wonder whether, why it is called a castle workshop. What does castle really mean, right? So I want to uh, begin uh, by uh, telling you the castle story, okay? The story is really about enabling, you know, AI meeting industrial production, in fact, mass industrial production. And I want to give you a flavor about how this uh, whole effort, you know, uh, was accepted and also grow you know, over the past few years. Uh, in fact, uh, they grow out of my own research group back in Carnegie Mellon when I was a professor there. Uh, and uh, 
many of the initial contributors you know, on the, on the, on the go. But, um, and also I'm going to introduce each of the castle projects with a few words so that you know actually technologically what they mean. But at the end of the day, we are here to solve industrial problems, right? So I want to actually close by showing you our vision and also the big picture about how the castle project, how you know, uh, the company of Petron, that is one of the major you know, uh, you know, propeller of the castle project, and also how MBZUI, who is now partnering with uh, Castle and Patron very closely to together drive our uh, industrial advancements, our economic advancements here in Abu Dhabi, okay? So Castle stands for Composable, Automatic, and uh, Scalable Machine Learning, right? It is a open source consorting on the GitHub with uh, many, you know, uh, smaller scale Libraries, each you know, cover a important scientific and also application area in artificial intelligence. And here is a panel that is actually growing, you know, on each of these, uh, you know, uh, topics or member uh, repositories. We are very selective in including new repositories into this consorting. You have to pass, you know, a certain level of uh, technical. You know, uh, you know, excellence. You need to also pass certain level of uh, you know, implementation quality, code quality, and evidenced by adoption, by the paper that uh, you published in major venues. And also, inside this contorting, we do a lot of uh, catalyzation and integration to make them interconnected so that you know, products and the solutions can be hopefully extracted you know, or, uh, or catalyzed on top of it, right? So um, how it come into form and, uh, and why we do that? Well, I guess we started from uh, our, you know, uh, basic story, you know, uh, of uh, how to be productive in the AI era, right? So uh, we all know that right now, everybody is talking about AI. Uh, the public's understanding of AI is like this, right? AI do amazing things. You know, uh, they, they beat human being, for example, in uh, complex games. They help scientists to, uh, you know, uh, make uh, discoveries and the scientific explorations, such as uh, discovering drug targets and uh, understanding pooling structures. And they provide, uh, you know, uh, uh, public you know, uh, service functions, such, such as in smart city, and uh, tracking events and traffic and so forth. And uh, also they sometimes do not necessarily you know, uh, great things. They could be used to produce uh, fake information, fake news, fake images, and so forth, right? And um, one of the uh, interesting trend also happening in the past few years was this emergence of uh, large-scale models, self-trained, self-supervised models. Uh, you can you know that GPT-3 and uh, and, uh, and uh, quite a few other uh, major uh, like Jihard and other models, which boast you know, uh, their size to be you know, uh, rivaling the number of neurons, for example, in human brain. You know, for example, right, right now, one of the large models that people are using is uh, having uh, uh, more than, you know, uh, in fact, more than 175 billion parameters. And uh, with these larger models, uh, people start to uh, you know, uh, come to uh, a uh, anticipation that uh, maybe you know, they would ultimately lead us to artificial general intelligence or even consciousness because the way they you know, expect themselves now is quite impressive. They can produce a very, very fancy and uh, you know, um, you know, uh, interesting contents, uh, having you know, uh, very uh, useful uh, you know, uh, products or uh, deliverables you know, in the space of uh, you know, uh, conversation system uh, image production and so forth, right? In fact, uh, there are big claims made by all these companies. It looks like, you know, we are almost at the brink of, uh, you know, reaching artificial general intelligence with the help of these big models, right? And, uh, but I want to point out that that's not the, the whole story. There are some uh, gaps which were kind of uh, brushed away, you know, or maybe ignored in the public, you know, space when we talk about AI. For example, 
you may notice that many of the celebrated advancements in AI is actually focusing on building you know, a very, very powerful brain like this and uh, like this. You know, there, there are a lot of uh, you know, uh, new ideas keep coming out to enhance you know, the very design and uh, the training and the implementation of uh, an artificial brain. Right? But um, somewhat awkwardly, it is only the brain that receives this level of attention. Right? And you can imagine maybe such a creature to be eventually created, which is very head heavy. Okay, you have a gigantic brain which can do everything or can imagine and, uh, and uh, maybe uh, reasoning about everything, but it cannot walk. And who brings them to your company? Who brings them to the customer? And so forth. Right? So these are actually interesting questions which may sound tedious, but I tell you these are also very serious scientific problems that requires a uh, huge amount of innovation okay, beyond even engineering. And that's actually what Castle is also trying to push for. You want to start looking for how to help users and, uh, and the deployers to uh, have uh, uh, to prepare their data, uh, to uh, uh, schedule or plan for learning, and also to do uh, cost optimizations, serving deployments, and so forth. Right? In fact, this is not done well at this point. I don't know. Many of uh, the attendees here probably are already, you know, having this uh, type of awareness. You are coming from big companies. This is a survey. You know, we 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 uh, we obtained, you know, from uh, credible sources asking CEOs and CTOs how happy you are with your AI deployment you know, uh, in your company. The result wasn't very, very uh, uh, strong or happy. You know, in fact, more than 70% of the CEOs are not very satisfied with the level of uh, AI deployments and, uh, and uh, deliverable in their company. Uh, in fact, yesterday in the JITEC, I heard a much worse number. I was told that 95% of the company CEOs are not happy, not just 70%. Right? And the, the reason being, not surprisingly, lack of uh, talents you know, uh, and uh, lack of the price is too high, or even there is no way to buy, nowhere to buy the solution, even if you have the cash and so forth. There are a lot of you know, uh, reasons for that, which I'm not going to go through. But uh, uh, for those uh, who are hoping for the open source community to give you uh, the solution, it's also you know, quite challenging. In fact, uh, the current uh, space of uh, AI and um, ML tooling is also very, very, well, it's peripherals, but also it's very confusing. Okay? It's so fragmented to the point that uh, even if you build a single solution, such as uh, you want to build a simple QA system, you need to navigate yourself in a maze of uh, parts providers and to somehow find a way to glue them together. Of course, gluing really means that you need to write all the code. Okay, you need to have a good engineering team that understands every package and also understand how to connect every package and to write good code to make them happen. But unfortunately, you have to do it uh, many times because uh, if you are building another product, say in the uh, computer vision space, you basically need to re-navigate and remap a strategy. And you need to do it again and again and again with many of the problems you have. That's obviously not how uh, industrial people make their solutions, such as producing an aircraft. Right? They're in aircraft or in, in auto you know, uh, production, automotive production. Uh, there are a lot kind of a more regularized, standardized approach. So indeed, I think you know, AI still you know, meets, needs to uh, you know, get you know, their first reinvention to bring them out of uh, this uh, black box that now we are often used to uh, create or to craft, I would say. That's probably the better word to characterize how we make AI solutions these days. And then turn into something like this, which are actually not unfamiliar with industrialists. Okay? You know, this process of uh, building industrial products has been there for at least 100 years after Henry Ford you know, uh, invented the assembly line of a car autom you know, automobile automation. And uh, that allows not only cost you know, uh, you know, uh, amortization and the benefits, but also it is a critical thing to make good products. For example, you can now you know, uh, you know, uh, embed you know, uh, some of the quality assurance mechanism to do error checking, to do certification, and so forth in every step. If I give you a big black box, how, do, how can you even certify that? 
can you break them apart? Well, it never come back again if you break it apart, right? So we want to actually promote that kind of uh, modern industrial process of AI. And to that, I think you know, the topic that we are going to touch upon today, such as you know, standardizing the parts using Lego-like you know, uh, modules and components, standardizing the architecture and the, the workflow. You know, how do you place workers and the skills and the uh, equipment you know, in a strategic way that they can be used and reused for producing different products, that definitely becomes you know, an interesting topic. And then, of course, you need to make the whole thing composable and certifiable, both at the level of uh, Lego uh, parts, workflows, but also strategy and the process. You know, the, the priority, the sequence, the timing, everything basically becomes you know, an open technical problem. And at the end of the day, you want to make sure that your results are predictable and explainable so that you can give the customer you know, a thesis and also a set of options that they can make their choices wisely and convincingly. Right. So with that, that enters uh, the meat of uh, the castle components. I'm not going to touch upon all of them because there are too many, but I'm going to highlight a few major uh, earlier backbone projects. The overarching idea is to really perform model-based or principle-based you know, optimization throughout this entire life cycle of ML so that uh, we leave no corner untouched in terms of a rigor, in terms of a high quality implementations. So that you don't just wave your hand and say, yeah, it's gonna happen, or let's put a band aid some, somewhere, hoping for uh, the whole thing to pass a PSO, a POS, and then uh, redo it once again once we go to the deployments and so forth. That's probably many of the experience that we had you know, when working with uh, you know, industrial projects. And uh, the key here is to implement and uh, design those solutions in a way that is principled and also predictable. Okay. So toward that, I'm going to maybe uh, say a few words each of uh, on you know, these uh, uh, specific dimensions you know, of, uh, of the AI production life cycle. In fact, uh, if you look at this panel, these are just examples of uh, what's needed to be taken care of, ranging from uh, building, composing you know, uh, a big model from pieces, tuning the models, you know, uh, you know, uh, fine tuning the models, you know, both in terms of uh, you know, improving the training efficiency or even to achieve certain you know, uh, you know, uh, unusual you know, performance metric, uh, paralyzing the computing so that they become scalable, scheduling the work so that multiple teams can be collaborating and productive, how to do bad pep good pipelining, and also how to eventually get rid of the coding and uh, make it uh, coding free, you know, uh, integration of the products and so forth. Okay, so that's basically my 5,000 meter high level story about Castle, and then I'm going to dive, dive, deep, dive deeper into some of the components, which is a little bit technical, apologies for those uh, who are uh, you know, not necessarily into equations. I'm not going to show you equations, but hopefully uh, you can appreciate the level of effort you know, on the back end we put you know, in justifying and in validating the solutions. So the first thing I want to say a few words is about how one should learn in such a world where everybody's talking about AI and machine learning. And what's the better way of learning? And what's uh, the not so good way of learning? Right. Well, actually the not so good way of learning is here. You know, I, I think uh, you'll see a picture already. This is the not so good way of learning, okay? You will throw it at a one-off kind of uh, fancy uh, set of mathematics and then uh, you were told that it's gonna work and then you build, go and build it. And then next time you build something else with a different board of equations. Right? We want to turn something like this, which is uh, having a universal blueprint so that uh, you can use that blueprint to really uh, learn everything, hopefully, in a much more standardized and uh, comfortable fashion. And why that's needed? Well, because uh, in almost every industrial problems we are facing, we already realize that it's not a very you know, a monochronic 
thin kind of uh, definition of uh, experience and data. You have to basically deal with not just the examples in the form of data, but also prior knowledge such as uh, your rules and uh, restrictions and regulations in your playbook, feedbacks when you are dealing with the clients, and uh, in fact, you may want to solve multiple tasks together. In the oil and the industry, you don't only drill, you need to ship the production, you need to also you know, man manage a uh, supply chain and so forth. Therefore, there are, you know, there's a big space of learning, which is uh, never kind of uh, siloed you know, uh, in your lab. And that means you need to basically learn uh, from all data and all experience all at once, like we humans do, rather than I have a model that learn only from image, another model learn only from text, uh, and then and so forth, right? And these are examples of those uh, experiences that nowadays already are studied by machine learning and AI researchers. And also, there is a potential to arbitrarily combine them to study interesting interplays between them. How we do that right now? Well, in fact, there is another uh, context that is now becoming uh, even more prominent we have now pre-trained large models, right? And uh, they can produce you, for example, you know, uh, they can become your email repliers, automatic uh, secretary, and written always in the way of a Shakespeare style, something like that. Or they can produce, so, uh, make your pictures, or your photo album, all Van Gogh style, right? So these are the kind of uh, amazing capability of the current uh, bigger model. Uh, but when you are talking about a real, you know, a client-friendly task in the space of a classification, you know, uh, uh, planning and control, forecasting, uh, I'm sure you realize that one more step in the form of fine-tuning the models or, you know, training add-on components will be needed. So you still need to learn. It's not like you are at the end of the learning already. Right? So for all this uh, learning task, the way we do now is that for each of these tasks, there's an algorithm there. There's a framework there, okay? In fact, there is a whole marketplace that is ever-growing every day. Uh, nearest conference grow from uh, 20 years ago, you know, 20, uh, two, two, uh, you know, 100 papers per year to now 20,000, uh, 2,000 papers per year. And there are many of these top conferences. Uh, it's to the point that no one find it feasible to even read all those papers and then find the best solution out of it. So you need to really handle a lot of uh, kind of uh, working or may not working, you know, uh, new innovations in this uh, heuristic and uh, algorithm market space. So there's a need to systemize it, right? Uh, so one of the projects in Castle is uh, based on you know, a finding from our group you know, which uh, discovers that, in fact, you don't need that many equations. You might just need one equation which can be kind of uh, instantiated and cast it into different you know, uh, use case specific realization. And this is called the standard equation, which looks like this. Again, forget about the math. The gist is that it is uh, a very generic equation that has placeholders for all types of experiences, for all types of uh, measurement of goodness, and also for all measurements of uh, you know, uh, resource and uh, self-confidence and so forth. And then when you plug in you know, specific mathematical forms for the experience function, for the divergence function and the, for the uncertainty function, you actually can recover almost all known algorithms that people practice in machine learning, such as active learning, reinforcement learning, you know, uh, generative adversary learning, and so forth. So I'm not going to go through the mathematics, but why that's interesting? Well, here is just a, a, a limited partial list of uh, how you can make use of the standard equation. Just to make it even more concrete, let's see, you know, maybe a potential interesting, obvious application of uh, experience composition. I said that you need to learn from multiple experiences. But in the machine learning you know, uh, current paradigm is treating every single experience as a learning problem and the build a step algorithm separately. Right? But under standard equation, your f, the experience function, can be you know, uh, instantiated in a way that is uh, providing a weighted combination of multiple experiences just through a summation. And then you throw the whole thing back into you know, uh, the standard model and learn all things at once. There are some technical kind of knowledge needed in terms of how to write down each of these F, 
but that's where you can very, very you know, uh, directly read specific papers or come up with your own innovations. Right? So just have an example here, how to, for example, train you know, a uh, text generator with a specific type of sentiments. Typically, you collect data with all the possible pairs, a particular text of a particular sentiment, and you collect all sorts of that and then train. But now, you can actually make it a lot simple, relying on very simple data. For example, just you know, a very, very small collection of text sentiment pairs, and then you add them with uh, other experiences from a sentiment classifier, from a pre-trained language model, and then all of a sudden, at the end of the day, you get high quality text production of the same content over all different sentiments, and also you know, well written in terms of linguistic quality. And you can see the score getting better and better when you add more and more experience into that. You can you know, uh, again further explore you know, many other potentials. One potential we found to be very interesting is called uh, you know, a transportation of the off-shelf you know, algorithm. Again, I'm a, a, a kind of a frugal guy in terms of running operations, right? If you already did something for one task, you want to reuse it. For example, this algorithm known as a policy gradient has been widely used you know, in the space of reinforced learning to learn rewards and so forth, but they were never used outside of reinforced learning to learn other things, okay? Because the policy gradient, it's about policy, and it's about uh, you know, uh, RL. But if uh, you want to use the lens of the standard equation to look at the, the paradigm of learning, you will see that uh, all experiences are just equal. They are all learnable. Therefore, you can now transition from learning the rewards into learning the strengths of a piece of uh, you know, prior knowledge, such as a rule, make them prompterized. And then suddenly your policy gradient algorithm can be used to learn the weights of a logical rule, which actually is uh, almost like trivial. You don't reinvent a new algorithm. You don't even need to publish a new paper, but you're guessing done already, right? So this is uh, just an example about how that can be practically useful. For example, you want to uh, build a virtual try-on app you know, on your iPhone that uh, a person don't have to go to the physical store, but can pick basically address, put on them, and uh, see how they look on their iPhone. How to do that? It's actually practically very interesting and useful, but it's very difficult because you don't have uh, the training data of uh, all the post position for all dresses. You may have the standard post position, frontal and side, on a few dress. How to extrapolate? Well, you extrapolate by using the, the rules that people can produce for the human body parts. You can write uh, quite a number of rules. Of course, these rules are rigid rules. It's either 90 degree, or zero degree, uh, 45 degree of your pose and so forth, and uh, you are standing still or you bend. But uh, you know, in real life, you want to move around and have all sorts of ge gestures, right? So that requires you to soften those rules to make them you know, uh, not a hard constraint. Maybe a combination of the rules are needed. That's where the rules themselves needs to be also learned in terms of their weights. So you can see all these needs very naturally, right? And then that becomes your order you know, uh, from the menu. And you can actually deploy the algorithm I just talked about so that uh, you can learn in the environment with small training data, with a lot of rules, and then further allowing the rules to be reweighted through learning, and then you can get better and better scores. So these are just examples of uh, you know, uh, what uh, the standard equation is enabling. But at the end of the day, coming down to software engineering and the architectural design, this actually leads to one of the members you know, in the castle called Texa. It's basically a box of uh, machine learning Legos where you can put together you know, different uh, you know, uh, model components, you know, various choices of encoders and decoders, various choices of classifiers, and then different type of experiences, different type of uh, divergence or cost functions, and then different types of uh, algorithms, and then make almost free and seamless combination to solve a problem in your hand. So that's the story of Texa, a member of the castle. Next story, now you learn. We know how to learn. But you know, uh, there is also another dimension of how to learn to learn, because you can learn you know, according to a schedule. Say, I, I, I read one book a day, and then do homework. You know, or you know, uh, uh, you know, maybe a different student would say that, uh, no, I learned 10 books a day, and uh, in small bites. Uh, and uh, I may want to do less homework, 
and uh, do more kind of uh, hands-on coding experience and so forth, right? So these are basically known as uh, you know, uh, the meta-learning part, learning to learn. Here are examples of uh, such uh, open space where you can learn to learn. For example, in uh, training larger or small models, you can play with the hyperparameters to control batch size, learning rates, and the many other things. You can also fidget with the neural architectures you know, to uh, make them wider or deeper, uh, add some more gates, and uh, add some more transformers to just uh, see how you capture the latent features better or worse. You can actually even fidget with the, the, the infrastructure to add machines or remove machines. That's especially useful when you do federated machine learning where your devices are literally just the edge devices that is not in your hand. They actually drop and uh, come you know, uh, based on uh, the user's uh, own kind of uh, plan and uh, behavior and so forth, right? So these are the space which are not yet heavily infested with uh, many learning algorithms. And of course, all this should benefit from the automation because uh, it's a high dimensional space, very complex, that is uh, not uh, very, very comfortable or convenient for human to be in the loop. And, uh, but uh, the challenge is that there are so many things uh, that uh, could be the subject of learning to learn. But uh, one thing is missing is uh, the actual mathematical form uh, is actually not there. Or maybe it's too complex to describe. What is the mathematical form of uh, a uh, big pre-trained language model that you can take and take a derivative and find a gradient of the hyperparameters? I don't know. Okay. And there are many other spaces that are equally, uh, maybe more complex. But this phenomenon was actually dealt with in other domains, such as in scientific explorations. You know, when you make chemical compounds, a typical way is not to look at the equations. You basically look at the whole, <laughs> this uh, big pot you know, that will be melting and uh, bending your ingredients. You try a little bit this, try a little bit that, and see how it comes. Right? What's the best kind of uh, alloy you, you get out of uh, uh, the mix? And, uh, but uh, a smart cook or a smart engineer wouldn't do it randomly he would know where to have the best next try to extract the best outcome. And I want to try as small, as fewer times as possible because every trial is, exp is expensive and slow, right? And that's basically the problem of learning from a black box, okay? You actually are learning how to optimize the black box without doing, you know, an analytical closed form derivatives. And that comes down to our next member of the CASEL project, which is, uh, you know, a, uh, a framework of uh, auto-tuning through model-based optimization. Again, you know, the author is right, sitting right here. We have uh, a lot of uh, mathematical nuances here, but uh, in the gist, the idea is very simple. You just learn a set of uh, two functions. One is known as the probabilistic equation function, which allow you to model the uncertainty of your experiments. You try a query into the black box, you get something out of it, how certain you are about the outcome because they want to make sure that your experiment you know, gives you highly predictable, anticipated answers. And the other function is called the acquisition function, which measures the utility of that trial. You want to not only be certain, but also make sure that it is useful, right? So very intuitive. So at the end of the day, you can actually start uh, you know, a, a, a learning framework which iteratively and automatically learn both of these functions. And once you know both of that, you actually know where to do your next experiment. So that uh, using as few as possible experiments, you converge and then you stay there with the optimal set of uh, hyperparameter or optimal set of uh, you know, meta-learning configurations. Right? So that's basically the tune project. It's literally, you know, again, you know, allowing you to uh, tune and the experiment like playing Lego. You know, in the middle, you have this uh, probable, you know, uh, you know, a uh, function that, uh, you know, uh, allows you to uh, uh, plug in different types of uh, acquisition functions and the acquisition models, and then use uh, different, uh, you know, optimization tricks and the mechanisms and so on, and the different ways of search the configuration space. But uh, outside of this box, you can, you know, literally, you know, uh, play with a different type of, uh, you know, input in the form of model and open space and output in terms of, uh, you know, uh, where to try the next experiment and so forth. And again, you know, the application of now is uh, only hyperparameter optimization, but uh, there are roadmaps toward, you know, uh, you know, NAS, neural architecture search, 
pipeline optimization system and so forth. Okay, um, that's the second component. Now comes down to further. So we've gone from uh, the principal into you know, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, a more kind of uh, Lego style, you know, uh, decomposition of the building blocks, and then how to tune them, but then how to do them at large scale. What well, large scale is now the topic of the day, because uh, uh, almost all the major AI machine learning innovations right now are either directly or indirectly benefit from having larger models on their background, or maybe it's directly in the foreground. But larger models, as we all know, is like the luxury and the you know really prized you know um, you know uh, innovations or product from high tech you know big companies right they don't really easily let go of their secret sauce and also it is very expensive it's uh, you know really requiring a huge amount of resource uh, that question that proposition could be revisited if uh, we've been careful about uh, how exactly large scale computing was done in fact one of our projects is to exactly unlocking these uh, bigger models, at least the way they are used, you know, from you know the big curtain from the big companies, and then hand it to every user. In fact, that was already happening at JetX. There is a joint uh, display uh, between you know, uh, you know uh, powered by uh, engineers from uh, the Petron company, members of the Castle, and also uh, students from uh, uh, MPCUI to show people how you can actually you know, through your very terminal, use this uh, big pre-trained, you know, image or text generation models to produce fancy contents at your own will. So if you haven't tried that, you should, uh, well, today is the last day, but hopefully we will be having some way, some other ways to, to support it online. The idea is that you really need to, you know, do a proper mapping of those larger models to nowadays, you know, state-of-the-art, you know, uh, computing infrastructure which uh, are made up of uh, very heterogeneous kind of uh, uh, machinery, such as high power GPU computing nodes, uh, connected to, you know, internally through you know, very high bandwidth uh, NVIDIA link, or you know, uh, different uh, computing boxes connected to the internet, the ethernet. How to basically make best use of them to compute every possible large models, right? I think, again, people probably already come to the realization the current tool available out there is not ready to deliver those results. They are either too generic, uh, but uh, really aim for very uh, preliminary level implementation, not sophisticated, not very efficient, or they are too specific uh, to the point that they only work for one model, in, uh, and also they may not be even available open source. So what is needed is uh, really a toolbox that is uh, really allowing people to address a foundational needs in the machine learning stack known as uh, any skill computing in the case, on you know, uh, task and the infrastructure management. Right. And again, you know, uh, in our uh, own you know, uh, fundamental research, one of the members of uh, CASO uh, come up with uh, a very elegant you know, principled formulation of this problem. Again, you know, it is not often time people see system implementation to be a mathematical optimization problem, but there is a way to do it, and you can only make things better by doing so. We talked about, for example, managing and playing with the model experience use the standard equation. Now, adding to the plate models to be computed, clusters to be managed, and then, of course, a strategy that is a mapping the model to the clusters. In fact, they all can become a uh, explicit argument in a bigger mathematical loss function that allow you to plug in, you know, uh, what you want to achieve, and then you solve this, uh, you know, a mathematical optimization problem in a principled way. Right? So the innovation here is to really come up with the formal representation of the infrastructure the formal representation and actionable representation of the models, and also, you know, a, uh, again, mesh actionable and uh, optimizable representation of the strategy. And then, basically, you are going to pick, hopefully, you know, your favorite loss function. It could be the performance score in terms of uh, intrinsic measure, like, a, you know, a likelihood or, you know, reconstruction loss. But it also could be your carbon footprint or other fancy things which are not necessarily 
you know, uh, widely practiced, and then you search in the optimization space. And hopefully, you, know, uh, you can turn this uh, whole program into something more universal to compile every large scale models. We're not there yet, but that's kind of the vision. Just to give you examples of two of the member projects uh, are currently delivering. One project is really to do the following. You started off from uh, a very, very uh, you know, uh, straightforward single machine serial implementation of uh, any input models. And uh, you are given the space of uh, all possible opportunities of uh, implementing a digital solution by combining ideas in the dimension of uh, you know, uh, inter-computer communication, a mathematical model for maintaining synchronization and consistency, how to divide the model, how to encode and decode the message, and how to schedule all the work. And then hopefully you find a path in this maze to come up with a strategy that allow you to play that piece of code automatically into a cluster. So this is called the automatic parallelization. <clears throat> and the other project uh, is uh, you know, uh, on uh, uh, scheduling. In fact, uh, just now, typically when people do the follow to, 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 to uh, do this, we worry about uh, getting the computing more efficient in the form of uh, like a, a throughput, like getting the computing as fast as possible. But also as uh, machine learning people all understand throughput may not necessarily automatically lead to the best result because uh, you also need to worry about statistical efficiency. How well you utilize each particular data point. Right? And that's usually another dimension which uh, doesn't necessarily you know, uh, go well with uh, the throughput. There may be a nice trade-off then we have another project which defines you know, uh, a new cost function called the good put, which combines the throughput and, uh, and, uh, and the statistical efficiency. And also do so in a way without assuming that there's uh, only a single user and a single task in your cluster, but multiple. And then you basically do you know, very uh, meticulous, elastic style scheduling of multiple jobs to let them interplay with each other and take advantage of uh, the dynamic you know, computing workload across different projects to reach a globally optimum usage of the resource. Right. Again, you know, this is uh, you know, delivered in the form that is legable. Okay. There are ways allowing people to make choices or either manually or automatically through the design space. And these are the three projects, AdaptDL, Autodisk and the OPA that we actually now have in the consortium to give you, you know, a, a kind of preliminary solution you know, for automatic scheduling, automatic parallelization, and so on. So I think I used more than the allocated time, but I'm about to wrap up. In conclusion, I think you know, uh, what I was uh, uh, just uh, describing so far is not only just to showcase you or explain to you the building blocks inside the castle. It's actually also to suggest you a vision that could be essential to push AI machine learning into industrial production, which is that you have to do machine learning at all levels, not just at the model level, finding smart algorithms. And only that happens, you can think about next step of autonomization, because uh, if uh, things are not even a white box exposing you all the you know, opportunities of engineering and innovation. Automation and autonomicity is uh, not having a hinge point. Okay? So I want to wrap up with uh, a final example to show you how things can come together. For example, even for a small implementation, say a QA system, there are all these building blocks. It's never a uh, black box monolithic piece. Right. And therefore, that requires you to basically do all that beyond just training and the inference. You need to do evaluation, deployments, and annotation, and so forth, and which require multiple moving parts and also at multiple granularity. And uh, with all these uh, you know, uh, Lego components that I described earlier, which, uh, some of which are already available in the CASO uh, consortium, you can imagine the following workflow. You pick a particular toolbox and start composing a machine learning model. Again, Taxa is our offering, but there are third party you know, solutions as well. But uh, they basically lead to a assemblage of the model, of one model. 
Then you assemble multiple models because uh, that's uh, what uh, a typical real solution is needed. Therefore, need, need to be pipelined. Then our other tool, which I haven't got a chance to mention, Forte is actually a tool for you to automatically, not, not automatically, but uh, uh, you know, code-free uh, assemble you know, many of these uh, different components by utilizing a universal and a standardized interface between different components. And then you can go next level down by exposing what is known as the public intermediate representation, which allow the whole assemblage to be further augmented, such as tuning the hyperparameters, such as dispatching them into different machines to get an automatic parallel uh, training and uh, treatment, all to be scheduled appropriately with other, along with other machines. The guy who sits at the terminal doesn't have to do all this manually directly. Hopefully there is a, a good interface, which I, you, will show, you will see in a second, that allow him to basically drag boxes around, make connections, and do it you know, without writing the glue code. And we are also hoping, and we believe that this approach can be applied to a wide variety of industrial uh, practical models. Right? Of course, behind the scene, which you don't see, is uh, a lot of work at the foundational level in defining the right representation and the abstraction at the data pipeline and the infra level, and also a big mathematical automation problem that requires, you know, uh, that enables alignment you know, of uh, entities at different levels, from data to model to meta model to infrastructures and so forth. But, uh, and also, of course, you know, at the end of the day, they have to be deployed onto the infrastructure and the cluster to kickstart computing and to be serviced. But uh, on the front, you don't see all that. You don't need to see that. What you see is uh, something like this. That's actually you know, where the company Patum took over, basically, or maybe uh, you know, uh, few, the next few miles you know, uh, of uh, codes coming out of or deposited into Castle to really turn them into production-ready, actionable pipeline enablers and assemblers you know, for multiple industrial solutions. So that's the vision, the Castle and uh, all research and Patton is trying to champion, you know, for AI meets industrialization. And uh, just to brag a little bit, you know, this uh, 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 technical roadmap has been uh, acknowledged, you know, uh, worldwide through, you know, a award from the uh, World Economic Forum, you know, 20, 2018 uh, Technological Pioneer Award and also a few other recognitions. All right, so to wrap up, the Castle project is really about identifying and also justifying and enabling machine learning at all levels, starting from the data all the way down to hardware infra pipelining. And I think this is uh, not only you know, a practical need, philosophically it's also beautiful, right? We know that uh, you know, human needs is multi-level. You don't just want to eat, or you don't want to just get uh, a spiritual life. You want to have all of that. Therefore, you know, you started from the foundation, you know, to have, uh, you know, basic needs for food, for security, but then you talk about self-actualization and spirituality and so forth, and that's exactly what inspires the machine learning, you know, uh, stack to be also similarly structured, right? And uh, through this uh, very, very explicit and actionable and uh, cast and also uh, maybe a, a definition of the problem, at the end of the day, we were able to bring you know, uh, the state-of-the-art mathematical technique and the statistical methodology into solving this uh, multi-level optimization problem. And that also allows you to really be open and uh, flexible of injecting, you know, or, or maybe of going beyond what traditional machine learning was trying to optimize at. In fact, uh, you know, there was an interesting observation made by Michael Jordan in the workshop last week and that when people train machine learning models, you use one standard. When you use machine model, you actually use a different standard. You're trained by maximizing a likelihood, or maybe max, uh, minimizing a, a reconstruction error if you are doing like encoder decoder things, right? But when you use it, you talk about uh, uh, how many bugs I have, or how, how often they crash, or you know, uh, maybe uh, how bad, uh, how uncertain you know, the answer will be. These are different loss functions you know, versus the loss functions you actually train the models. Now with this new framework, Hopefully, there is an opportunity for you to better align 
what you really want to achieve versus uh, how you train your model. Okay, and hopefully to see less surprise when you are deploy you know a you know a mysterious trained creature into your uh, production cycle and production line. Last but not least, I do want to acknowledge one newest project in our project, which is about uh, multi-level optimization. I hope I already justified that multi-level optimization now is the way to go when you are talking about optimizing and uh, learning at all levels. And usually that's a nested set of optimization problems, the solution of which should never violate the other cycles and other levels. Right? And that actually is uh, you know, mathematically even a new frontier you know, for people to explore. And uh, we are there okay, with this uh, new member, uh, Betty project, one of our members is already looking into ways of uh, solving multi-level optimization you know, uh, using you know, a standardized toolkit that is uh, generic for different applications. So in a nutshell, I think you know, uh, to allow AI meeting industrial production, there is a need and there is already a trend uh, led by several very, very uh, uh, you know, uh, ambitious projects and uh, companies to develop industrial agnostic, what we call the AI operating system that can serve the needs of production and uh, innovation across different applications. And the long-term vision is that most of the solutions that we are going to use in the future should be really pre-made. They should be pre-made and uh, kept in a library, well maintained, and then when you need to go customization and deployment, you do the rest 10% through domain experts and through engagements with the client. And then hopefully our world of uh, engineer will be transforming from a uh, very painful and uh, messy you know, a work style into a uh, no tier style of uh, Lego, Lego uh, block playing and the strategic uh, implementations. Okay, and of course, you know, as a university, we want to also be there to really champion the science and support the science behind it. And these are the new opportunities that we identify along with the industrialization of AI. These are not just builder bigger and bigger models and getting more and more data. It's about now thinking beyond what the current solution is offering to really, you know, for example, you know, you know, seriously look at how system behave and how compiler should be redesigned. And then even to think about how different agents will collaboratively learn something and how to quantify the uncertainty of the results and even how to design strategies and mechanisms to allow you collect high confidence, high quality data from the user. Because if you don't do that, the user will also play game with you. They have no incentive of giving you their own data unless you give them an incentive. Right. So these are basically the next frontier in machine learning where we believe AI will be reinvented to sit on not just computer science, but also statistics and economics and their interplays. And uh, the, the Castle project will keep evolving to really be the undertaker of those uh, new innovations, but also do the extra work of uh, making them integrable and also integrating them with uh, additional projects out there in other companies or in the academic community. And Patron is, uh, again, the other kind of uh, downstream catcher to do the commercialization and also the productization of those ideas to turn them into really uh, you know, reliable and high quality implementations. Last but not least, MBCUI, you know, uh, which is a two year old university, right now is uh, working very closely with both the Castle project and also the Petron company and also many of the friends who are already sitting there. And we want to make more friends and uh, hopefully uh, make, in, in, make possible more implementations and uh, collaborations. Uh, just to brag at you how good we are right now. I think uh, the past two years is, has been amazing. I'm privileged to be able to stand here and lead this uh, organization. We are now already among the top 30 uh, AI programs worldwide. And we have a very, very uh, powerful bench of uh, faculty coming from all over the world. Most of them actually come from uh, top schools in other 
uh, country and other university, and they chose to come here to work together to push for the next wave of innovation in AI. And we are also taking graduate students from all over the world. Hopefully, these faculty, these students, when they graduate, can join your company here to become the pillar of uh, your uh, AI revolution and also your uh, market campaign. Okay, I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm happy to answer questions if time allows. Thank you. So uh, in the interest of keeping the schedule moving forward, uh, we will allow time for one question uh, to Eric. Uh, who would like to, to take the shot at uh, you know, addressing this extremely comprehensive and total overview of the castle ecosystem? No question is you know, too unimportant or too small, uh, but uh, hopefully it'll be a defining moment for this uh, opening this entire workshop. So anyone would like to take? Yes. So have you thought about allocating some consideration for um, how do you control or how do you manage ethical issues in AI development when you're delivering something like this at scale? Because this is all fantastic and when we're autonomi autonomizing and we're rolling out AI in such an you know, uh, independent manner, I think these are, so there are some things that can drop out of this. So if we do, I believe that we should be looking at something like that. Absolutely, it's an excellent question, ethics. Everybody is talking about right now. I think uh, when you talk about uh, ethics over a black box, this is uh, you know, uh, you know, really you know, uh, a, a blind talk. You, know, you really don't know how to make them actionable and also how to even find a hinge point, right? So I can address them from uh, three dimensions in here you know, in terms of how our project relates to ethics. First of all, at the engineering level, we are trying to turn the black box into a white box and also actionable and directly you know, uh, you know, uh, accessible at your fingertips. And that's where you can actually inject your ethical or ethics consideration and the regulation compliance into an actionable way so that you can, for example, put a certifiability program for the whole or into different parts of that. It can also regulate you know, uh, where I should set a brick to prevent their abuse or proliferation and so forth and where I can control the quality of the data so that uh, they don't get biased and become unfair and so forth. So at the engineering level, we support these type of accuracy, you know, you know, uh, operations. Right? And then at the, uh, the science level, you know, uh, it allows us to chart new maps in scientific research because uh, ethics, even though it is very abstract, it can actually be mathematicalized and then turn into really a quantifiable and uh, even uh, analyzable kind of implementations or strategies. You know, th here I talk about the strategic games. How do you set up the equilibrium and define the laws inside the game? How can you actually balance the incentives of uh, individual versus the society as a whole? It's actually you know, something that can be mathematically modeled and simulated so that you can design the right metric and the regulation and policy so that it is uh, not only you know, uh, enforcing or promoting good ethic and practice, but on the other hand, not at the risk of uh, suppressing innovation or you know, locking down opportunities and so forth. Right? So that's the mathematical level. Then, of course, there is uh, a policy and the regulation level, which I personally have uh, not too much control. But uh, as a university, as a company, we want to be an active player of that. We can make ourselves as uh, a, you know, a experimental playground or become an active participant you know, of uh, participants of um, you know, the, uh, the whole strategy and uh, the movement to offer our own experience in a uh, very tangible and explicit way so that decision makers hopefully can draw good lessons from us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's great. great to see all of you. I don't want to take too much of the time. Maybe uh, it's time to move to the next talk. Right, let's give our speaker one more round of applause. Great. Right.
that also finished my uh, two-week long foray into like all five talks. I'm happy that it wrapped up so nicely. Thank you. Right. Thank you for the kind words, Eric. Okay, so.